Dennis, and I just recently joined Lane at the requirement. And so I would like to share with some of the research that I have been doing for a while, and I'm really pleased to say that I'll have two students, very good ones. Um, yeah, unfortunately, their work is not yet done to be presented, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's next time, next year. So um, I, I, for, for a number of years, me and collaborators have been trying to develop a new uh, formula models for open system dynamics and uh, to address some fundamental challenges in the current view. So when we have a large system, uh, watch that bottom, bottom. Oh, the bottom is, is yeah. So um, when you have a large system of like, uh, which is typically the case all, all the time, if, you know, it's usually a quantum system is coupled to some reservoir and the reservoir does something bad to the system. So, and of course the evolution, as far as the uh, evolution of the, of the system of interest is concerned, is not gonna be unitary. Um, and we would like to be able to sort of arrive at the equation of motion for the, the that subsystem. Uh, how it's done, uh, it's done by the theory of open quantum system, and that's sort of the traditional approach, uh, which uh, at the first stage you say, okay, so my whole system is going to be first describable by a, Schrodinger equation, but it's for very, very large degrees of freedom, number of degrees of freedom. Uh, for example, here's an example of a system that you have some um, molecule, large molecule, merged in some complicated environment, and you would like to describe, say, some photo, photo dynamics. So um, the whole system, you know, bottle and universe and observer and everything is unitary, but nevertheless, uh, we know that actually as far as optics is concerned, uh, then all the optical effect happens here, so that's actually our system and everything else is to be uh, considered to be the bar. Uh, and we would like to have an equation of motion which is just described by very few degrees of freedom uh, which is going to be non unitary So this is done by averaging out uh, original large system. And two things happen when you average out. First, you need to use many approximations. There's only one model that there, when this averaging out uh, does not involve approximations. Unfortunately, that model doesn't work. Um, and it's in physical. But usually, most of the time, you use many approximations, and there are two types of approximations. Some are bad and some are good. Uh, the bad one, or the good ones are the ones that you are actually aware of, explicit approximations, and the bad ones, I don't know what's going on, I think this is a, uh, uh, the, the, the bad ones are actually implicit, when you actually make an approximation without actually realizing it was an approximation. Uh, and that's the one that one has to be really watch out. So, and so you arrive at the equation of motion. As a result, usually, yeah, it's some equation of motion for a density measure to describe this system. And what happens is that nothing in this procedure guarantees, well, this is, this is uh, okay. auditorium has a allergy on <laughs> me. <laughs> and it's a punishment. Uh, and, and basically, there's nothing that guarantees that actually that some dynamics that you would like to be able to describe will be describable. It's always coming back. Yeah, it's not something that's Yeah, it's not something that's Yeah, so and basically, you know, there's nothing that guarantees that the arrival equation of motion will uh, match the observations. Uh, and moreover, actually, there's nothing that allows you to say that obtain the equation of motion is actually obeying basic laws of quantum mechanics. And this is actually a big, big problem. Uh, most of the useful master equations. Uh, actually, they, uh, we know that they are, for, long, for example, like Leggett Caldera model, uh, it, you cannot use it for long time propagations, right? It has to be used only for short time. So this is a serious, actually, issue if you think about it, because uh, ideally you would like to have that, you know, your equation of motion is useful, and your equation of motion is physical, right? Not just useful, not either useful or physical. You're gonna have to be both. So the idea is of our um, approach was to actually um, to kind of to overcome this challenge in traditional framework and to sort of, at the first step, to ignore all these steps and flip upside down uh, this paradigm by beginning by saying that, okay, let's just state what kind of dynamics you would like to be able to capture for your master equation. And then in what type of language you would like to describe it, you know, is it quantum, is it going to be classical, is it going to be some kind of hybrid model? Uh, and then if 
these two input informations are compatible because they sometimes may not be compatible, then this set of equation, the set of methods uh, supposed to actually give us an equation of motion for, you know, for the density matrix, if you want a density matrix, and uh, by construction, this actually mass equation will be able to capture observations of interest, and by construction, if you want it to be quantum, it will be, uh, it will be quantum. So that's sort of uh, the thing that I wanted to, to say in general. And I would like to show two applications of this, of this approach uh, quickly, uh, which is one application is actually uh, to the area, which is called quantum reservoir engineering. And then hopefully we'll have some time to say about how to make that look like gold also. So let us actually start with tunneling. Before I introduce us to wandering, uh, so usually you think that tunneling is, of course, tunneling is a, is a hallmark quantum attack. No, this is this Um, so quantum is a hallmark uh, effect, right? It was the first application of quantum, me of quantum mechanics to describe experimental data, uh, which was actually output decay. Um, so there is a prevailing wisdom, um, which is, you know, 99% of the time is true, that a coupling a tunneling particle to some bath and environment will actually introduce the coherence, and, you know, therefore actually tunneling rates will go down. We'll restore the plastic to the wall. So you know, when you throw a ball at the wall, the ball doesn't go somehow through the wall, it just bounces back again. So, but you're going to say that this is, we're going to show an example where it's not the case. So we're going to use this formula to actually find a large class of environments where actually not only they preserve the tunneling, but they actually enhance the tunneling. So let me actually begin by showing this animation. And this is a tunneling, this is the solution to Victor equation, Wigner and Moyle equation, um, for a tunneling particle. How many of you are familiar with Wigner equation? We are Wigner function, we know that. Um, yeah, it obeys Wigner equation, yes, Wigner function. So let me just quickly introduce, because I'm, uh, there's going to be a slide for the sub simulations. Uh, so, the, so basically, Wigner equation, as far as mathematics goes, uh, looks like this. It's a, uh, it's a Fourier transform of the diagonal of the density matrix, right? So this is how it's connected. What it is is actually, it's very, um, not really widely known um, formulas, which basically, uh, which is, you know, it's best to introduce by analogy with the sound. So if you have a, you know, your favorite song can be stored by MP, in an MP3 format, which is basically uh, amplitude is the same as a, as a, as a frequency uh, in, 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 a, in a frequency domain, or it can be also saved in a time domain, which was, you know, CD-ROMs and vinyl. Uh, so its amplitude is saved as a, as a of time. So this is actually the same as, uh, actually I wanted to show here, um, this is a function of time or frequency, right? So this is actually, this is what like Schrodinger equation is. It can be coordinate representation, you know, say time, and it can be momentum representation, say, you know, say frequency, right? And it's up to a Fourier transform only. So the Wigner actually uh, is kind of analog, to, uh, it's, uh, it's basically an, a musical score of quantum mechanics. Uh, what it means is that in musical score, right, we have actually we have frequency at the same time as, as time, actually. This, so th th these two axes are on the equal footing. So the function does exactly the same thing. It actually, it's a function of two variables, x and p. Uh, so, we should, so it's a science of moment, position and momentum to a quantum particle. And it's, a, it's not an approximation, it's an exact full picture, close, logically beautiful, uh, mess, very difficult for actual calculations, but nevertheless, it's fully consistent. Uh, so this is actually what it looks like. Okay, so this is how it looks like. So this is actually, so this is phase space, this is P and this is X, right? And the below, below plot, bottom plot is actually probability distribution as a function of position, which comes as a solution to the Schrodinger equation. So there's a barrier, Gaussian barrier at the center. So you see most of the wave packages bounced off a little bit, tunnel through. Uh, but it's much more beautiful in the Fignan picture. Wigner, Wigner function is real, but ne not negative, or can, can be negative. As you can see, this is the phase space, so we can draw a boundary between 
classically allowed and classically forbidden regions of free space, right? Um, so originally your wave factor is Gaussian, so it's fully contained in the, it has a positive momentum, right? And now it hits the barrier, uh, most of it reflects, but a little bit goes through it, right? And you can see these splashes of negative and positive values. That's actually like a consequence of quantum mechanics. You might have said, but what is the red and the blue? Is that yeah, it's a red is a positive value, blues are negative values. Why do you see fringes and negative values in the space of space? Because, the, very good question, excellent question, that's actually a stronger cat state. Basically, it's a signature that this portion of the wave packet has a, a locked phase relationship with the, with the wave packet that went through. And that's actually a signature of quantum coherence, basically. At least uh -huh. In the coherence, we'll wash out the thing. So it's amazing, uh, uh, it's a great format, and actually we've done some uh, kind of interesting work on this, uh, especially when it's applied to relativistic systems. And, you know, we are actually face based creatures, right? We, uh, you know, we think it's position velocity. This is very intuitive, and it's great that quantum mechanics allows for this language. I think it allows many interpretational things. So now, when you measure current, though, that as though you had a, a tunneling happen, does the, the probability on this side collapse? Uh, I mean, it would collapse sort of as a, I mean, it's, it, this is picture is nothing, it's equivalent to, to Schrodinger. It's not, it's not, gonna, it's not different. Okay. The current is, is, is related to the, to the momentum, yes, yes. Uh, to, to this axis. Uh, yes, what does it represent that the, for the Wigner function, it's not a vertical line, but there's... The Wigner function, ah, the, you mean the fringes, the, the middle thing? No, 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 like in the graph itself. The, bo the boundary. It's sort of the ah because the it's a numerical solution, right? And you don't like uh, numericals don't like uh, steps, so it's a, because it's a smooth Gaussian, so it's that smoothness actually gives you yes, 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 that's a good question. Um, okay, let's uh, go ahead and some other question. Well, what do I make of this big purple splotch in the middle? Yeah, so that what you mean is precisely the fact that uh, the particle, the portion of the wave packet that tunnel through, and the portion of the packet that got reflected has a constant phase relationship. And it's not observable. If you were to do tomography, you would see this thing, actually. But like, if you just look at the distribution of x or distribution of p, you would not see it because distribution is nothing else but by the marginal of this. Of the, so it, you know, the x distribution is integrated out p coordinate, and you don't see it because it's a very sharp sequence of negative and positive values with a bunch of shot. So if I do the tunneling experiment with coherent states that are classical states, they have positive Wigner distribution. Why? I will expect the same tunneling effect. No, it will not happen. It won't happen. happen. It will just everything will bounce off. Basically, you will not have not, neither of this will be blue. Nothing. Mm -hmm. It will just bounce off. Really? Yeah, it will just bounce off. Doesn't this start with a coherent state? Yes. So. No, but the evolution, quantum classical evolution, right? Uh, oh, sorry. You mean like the, the, the coherent state, but the evolution is the same. Means it's a but, still quantum but, illusion. But then why? Yeah, but I would. So I was thinking like how. Yeah, so that's a different question. That's a question how it will look like in classical dynamics. So classical dynamics will just bounce off, right? But this is yeah. This is a coherent. This is a Gaussian coherent state initial condition, right? This is this is exactly what you asked. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thanks for. Okay. So well, I didn't expect so many questions. <laughs> <laughs> I should have have done a different presentation. <laughs> <laughs> next year. Next year. What kind of less cool video? I see. Anyway, so that's just tunneling, coherent tunneling, right? So, you know, if once you start cranking up the coherence, it starts actually washing out these things, and basically nothing goes, goes um, to the cloud, can go to the, this thin layer of a classically forbidden region. Okay, so that's the reason. Like I said, so let's just actually try to use. Uh, so, we're not the first one to say that there are uh, systems where. Incoherent interactions with the bath that actually can enhance the tunneling, but uh, he said that there are a lot of them actually. Uh, there are many more than one can expect. We found some new physical insights that people follow. So let's just use our framework to actually to try to understand what kind of where this can happen. So observations. So uh, observations in, for our methodology, which is called operational dynamical modeling, has to be recast in the form of. Uh, NFS like relationship, uh, constraints between expectation values, or also it's known through the model in solid state, and things like this. So if you if you have a pure coherent dynamics, 
right? No environment, just pure Schrodinger equation. The position and momentum of a quantum particle are described by these equations. That's what you find in the textbook. Um, and this U of X is your potential vector. And just so I wanted to stress something out, the methodological comment, averaging is outside of you, not inside of you. Not to be confused with the quantum situations. Now, so we want to somehow enhance the tunneling. We want to enhance the transport, meaning we want to get the wave packet from here to there, right? So what is the simplest, the most naive way to do it? The simplest way is actually to pretend that the, the binary is not there. You know, to pretend it's not there. Right? In other words, to serve artificially set it to zero. And I want to explain what it means to artificially set it. In other words, we would like dynamics to look like this. Which actually is very nice, right? You have expectation of P is kind of constant, meaning you know it's it's not bouncing off. You're suppressing the reflection. You're actually just mm -hmm. letting it go through. Is this actually clear? So we would like dynamics to look like this. Does it make sense? Mm -hmm. right? Rather than this. So we want to use that to, to pretend it to be zero. Okay. So now, what is the formula of this equation? So this is an open system theory, right? So therefore, all these expectation values have to be represented as an average with respect to the density matrix. And the density matrix uh, is going to evolve according to the, you're going to postulate, we want to find most general master, uh, we want to find most general Markovian models that produce that dynamics. So therefore, the master equation has to look like this, and this is a, a famous Lindland master equation. So if you just have this term, this is nothing but Unitary evolution is one Newman equation. This D describes the coupling to the bar, a known coupling to the bar. Now, so um, we assume H to be known. Uh, so H is actually is fixed. You see, and this is that guy U. This is that bad tunnel. This is the barrier that you want to somehow fight over. So it's not zero. It's here. It's, it's here. Um, and of course, X and P uh, engage in canonical permutation relationship. Now, so what's unknown here, we assume, is A, our A's. Coupling to the buff is unknown. But the unitary part is fixed and known. Coupling to the buff is unknown. So why do we use this uh, limbland black master equation? I hope you're keeping track of time. We've got all the time in the world. Okay. Um, <laughs> that's a very bad thing to say. <laughs> anyway, so do, do you know guys why do we want to use limbland equation? Besides Markovianity, like, <laughs> ignore Markovianity. This answer has one very important property, actually. It will guarantee you, it will guarantee that the state will always be quantum. Wherever the shape of the matrix A, the row will always be positive definite. And this is very important. So it, unlike other approaches, our, the, the final master equation is going to be physical. We should not. We don't have to worry about neg negative probabilities emerging. emerging. So, <clears throat> so what we do, we look at this and we see. What do we see here? Okay. So we see here. Uh, so this is all given, right? This is right now our, our, our input. Look at this. We have expectation. Certain relationship between expectation values. We have a derivative, right? Expectation values expressed uh, through uh, raw. Raw, raw depends on time. Uh, the derivative of rho is, uh, connects to rho in this way, right? And we know what is x and p, we know also what is h, we know everything. The only thing is unknown is a. Right? So we treat this as a kind of very, kind of not very usual system of equations, right? You have some, some averages somehow connected, you have some matrix relationships, and so you want to solve this with the spectral unknown matrix. So it turns out to be solvable, and actually it's, the answer is this. For arbitrary real value function R, um, this kind of A will make Markovian dynamics with the barrier look like this. You also assume this is a single line by operator. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Oh. For this presentation, so that equations don't look too complicated. Wow. But in reality, it's not. You'll see generalization in a second. Wow. In a second in the general. Okay, so this is, you know, this is, first of all, first message here is that it's non-unique. There are, you know, 
uncountably many environments that actually can do this. Uh, we, however, we found only one physical, <laughs> physical interpretation. Uh, let's just show actually how it looks like, what it, you know, the, the claim that this actually works. So the top three plots are actually just snapshots of the simulation you saw before. You know, you have a wave function, coherent state at the beginning, then moment of collision with the barrier, and then you see, uh, actually in this case, I, I'm cheating, this is a higher barrier, so you almost see no town. This is a tiny, tiny amount. Slightly, slightly goes there, like less than one, significantly less than one percent. Now, so this is actually exactly the same snapshots for our open system that I showed you. So the packet comes and it really just goes through with no, you know, P does not change, right? P is constant. Now, so for comparison, uh, this is a free evolution, free coherent evolution means in a Schrodinger equation where u set is to zero, where u is set to zero. And this is how it looks like. And you can see there's no barrier because it's a free evolution. However, there is still barrier here, right? The only thing is different between that system and this system presence of the dissipation of the coupling to the environment. So you may actually see this as well. This looks shockingly the same. Uh, it's, but it's not. Actually, for closer inspection, you will see that there are some uh, things here which are not, this is not Gaussian. For all times is Gaussian. This is slightly deviated from the uh, But nevertheless, the purity of this, this state is quite high, 95%. So what we have shown that actually we can actually uh, have coupling to a buff, to specially designed buff, such that you not only make the probability time to be one, but also almost preserve purity, almost. You cannot preserve it, but you, know, you sacrifice a bit by enhancing, uh, enhancing coherent transport. Any question? Well, um, my, maybe a general question. So um, I'm not so familiar with uh, this uh, Lindblad equation, but uh, the, my question is, Okay, you found some A that yeah. uh, satisfies this property, but do we know if this has any, do we have environments that have such A or? Yeah, so let me just, so what's actually, what's the mechanism? I should have probably this. Uh, so the mechanism actually turns out that, uh, yeah, you can find a specific form of function A, of this form, right? In other words, there's a shape of R, like specific choice of R, this free, like freedom, right? Experimental freedom, gauge freedom, you know? where it corresponds to an example of atoms trapped, uh, basically you have an atom like an electronic trap, where the environment is the uh, additional electrons jets were scattered out the atoms. So that's, the, that's the environment. And trap, of course, is modeling the, the barrier, the coherent barrier. So what happens in this case is actually uh, the, the, the environment is here is, is uh, jets of electrons which collide with the, with the atom, with the trapped atom, and they're like designed in a very peculiar way. Velocities. And it actually, what happens in reality, it mimics something that you experience every day if you bike, if you don't bike whatever, whatever you bike last time, is that when you climb over the hill, right, it would be nice, it helps a lot if you have actually wind pushing, right, it's, it's easier. And then once you, so this is precisely what the electron jets is doing, it's actually tailored in such a way that once packet comes here, it gets pushed, gently pushed so that it doesn't destroy coherence. Gently pushes to the top, and once as you climb over the potential barrier, you start gliding back off. And what happens is that second wind picks up and gently slows down in such a way that you know your wave packet doesn't get kind of all over the place. And so this is just a wind effect, quantum wind effect on our system. Okay, so that's one example. Any other question? So I've used this uh, reservoir engineering word on many slides. I haven't actually introduced it yet. So it's basically, it's as you probably have uh, had guesses, the idea is actually to use reservoir, i.e. bath, as your kind of friend, you know? In the sense that yes, you, you know, we know that, we know that everything is not possible, all the coherent properties cannot be preserved with the bath, just not possible, but we can probably enhance them, sacrifice a little bit, find some compromise. So it's a system that this, Research study, which which is also experimental right now, has some experimental work, is basically trying to use environment to enhance quantum properties, whatever is enhancing. So, you have in mind in this, we actually we can generalize that example that I just showed you, Tom. We can we can say, oh, 
if that works, let's just let's just go nuts and you know completely ask. I want to this dynamics. So no, I don't know what is f, any f, any g. We will talk in a second what it, what it, any what other choices mean. I right? do remember uh, g was this thing was fixed, right? It was p over m, um, where m was the mass of the particle, of course, and f was uh, basically set to zero, right? We, we wanted not to have the barrier. And as you requested, we have multiple, you know, limb <laughs> And you plug this all in. They all have the same sh shape. This D has the same structure. The, the structure is the one that is really important. Uh, it doesn't matter. The number does not matter. Meaning, like, it's not going to violate the positivity of the density matrix. Uh, the one that makes it work is the specific structure of each term. But each sort of sum corresponds to different uh, incoherent interaction. So, and then you plug it in, and actually, yes, you saw all of them. So it's a bit uh, complicated stuff, but it, you can see it's a kind of generalization of what you said so, so before. The same, it has generally the same structure, uh, but it has more freedom. It became, you, you, it, there's more freedom. I have a question, which is just kind of a curiosity. Um, if you're dealing with a finite dimensional density operator, is there some limit on k and n for one bar k? Like with, so, with quantum channels, the Krauss representation, there's like upper bound. So what do you mean by how many? Ah, yeah, how many some finite yeah. dimensional system. Yeah, yeah. Is there is k related to the dimension in some way? It's uh, at most you know n square minus one. But oh, okay. uh, this is a very good question because look at this. I'm working with infinite dimensions. Yeah. Things actually, uh, in order to solve for a known ace, it turns out it's easier to do infinite dimensional things. Oh. Yeah, it's easier to do. finite dimensional. There are many problems actually. Uh, means you have like you can have many exceptions. You know, in many cases. No, you don't. You don't assume anything, right? You just assume that. Um, so that's a question of physical interpretation, right? So we just, in this kind of axiomatic way, you first say that oh, actually, if you just had, had more Mercurian evolution, you can achieve any type of dynamics you want. Ah, guys, I always keep forgetting this fact. This is kind of really important. You know, th this thing that I show you, this enhancement, this works for any state. In an initial state. That's what's interesting. Because you know, wind works for anybody, right? Also. <laughs> Light or heavy, you know, it doesn't. I mean, I mean if you. Cross, cross section does not, you know. In fact, cross section can help, right? So, but the point is that this is, this, those really equations do not depend on the initial condition. So, this is actually, uh, it's not some super tuned initial condition plus super tuned environment. No, it's a super tuned environment that works for any initial condition. That's very important. Likewise, this. It's a super tuned environment that works for any initial condition. And we can achieve pretty much any dynamics you want. That, that's, the, that's the kind of thing of machine from this slide. Um, so usually we think of the environment as something that uh, there are degrees of freedom we can control. Yes. But I guess here you're proposing that um, you engineer the, the environment. Yeah. So I mean, it's not. Consider that to be like an environment? It's just something. No, but for example, in, 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 in uh, this wind example, right? When you when your yeah, system is. Uh, uh, environment is the like, electron jet which flies. So what you don't control there is the phases between atoms and and the, uh, and the, the basically you know that information you cannot control. But what you can control, I assume, is that you can control velocities. You know, initial velocity of electron jet. Okay. Basically, so in, yes, there are always something that you cannot control, but something you still can control. Right? So, some, so some then, can you really consider that as being part of the environment or the one? Yes, because the evolution is not unit, uh, not unitary. Uh, of the system of, of this subsystem. Right? So, so then you can just consider whatever you're interested in and that other part, and then you yeah. But you, uh, but what's your initial condition for all the phases of all the electrons in, in the jet? That's the problem, right? You need to know more information. Yeah, in principle, you know, mm -hmm. right? If you can solve the big Schrodinger equation, you know, we don't need this stuff. Right? We don't need this. But if you don't, if you cannot solve or you are not able to characterize the system to this point, then that's where it's important. But you have. To you need to be able to control some aspect of the environment. Yeah, some aspects, yeah. Not all of this. Right? But always, like, in the practical environment, even in the models that are widely used, right, there is, you know, you assume to spectral density to be specified. Usually what, I mean, as far as I know, what people usually do is there, there's some, you, you have control over your system only, and then you're trying to vary the parameters in your system such that you can contact the specs of the environment, which are not really known to you. Yeah, 
No, but for example, when an experiment this is uh, quantum optimus people write an experiment, they actually close the sh windows in the, you know, or go to the basement to do experiment. That's okay. actually, you control the environment, right? Okay, sure. You're trying to eliminate certain frequencies, right? So, you know, okay. there's, yeah, there's always this minimal uh, degree of control, right? Okay. To, to an extent. Right? So of course, that needs to be, uh, so this kind of things would require quite, a, quite, a, quite more than, than sh shutting yeah. up the door or the window, you know? But it doesn't assume full that you know all the states of pho like photons and other stuff. Okay, so let us just see some examples which kind of go under this umbrella, more generic umbrella of this dynamics. Um, so example number one is uh, actually is, uh, you know, minus of what I have shown before. Assume you have a free quantum particle, right? So it described by this solution. And now I want to design an environment that actually tracks it. So we want to come from here to here. So this is the choice of F and G, right? Here, here you go. So F is here given by U, where U is whatever you want. So yes, so there exist dissipative traps. Traps don't have to be uh, uh, exerted by conservative forces. And that section has been recognized a year before. Dissipative forces could also trap a particle. Now, there is something uh, much more interesting part is that usually in a coherent evolution cannot change this, this G. This is just, that's it, it's a your dispersion relationship. It's fixed. It's fixed by nature. You can, you know, slightly twist your potential force, right, on the right, which means F, usually, in, you know, in a Hamiltonian picture. But this is, you cannot change. That's your dispersion, it's a fundamental thing. Uh, but here actually, uh, non-dissipative interaction, right? Dissipative environment actually allows you to modify this function G, the dispersion relationship. For example, you know, we have some isolated particle of mass M. You can make it isolated part, look like isolated particle with mass another, wherever you want you M. And this is actually, this is what happens, right? This is, this is known for like 100 years in, so in condensed matter physics, right? It's called effective mass approximation. So in other words, the electron in a solid still can be described as a, as a, you know, as a individual electron, in fact, classically, meaning by these kind of relationships, through the type of relationships. However, mass gets changed, and the different mass. And so all the effects of the environment goes into kind of one case, as if mass becomes a, a renormalization constant. Mm -hmm. And so mass can become, of electrons, what can it be? It can be actually up to hundreds of electrons or thousands of electrons mass in condo phenomena, or it can be zero, as in Rafi. Right? So, so yeah, that's what actually happens in condensed physics. And it's nice because they actually people don't use the density matrix in condensed matter actually. Here. But actually, that actually shows you that's why it is. This is this, condensed matter is itself a theory, it's open system. Now there's something more, uh, you can do more, right? In principle, you can, you can take, you know, you can isolate a particle with some potential and turn it to kind of relativistic particle um, uh, with artificially lower speed of light, right? Which actually is interesting because in this case, like your Hamiltonian really looks like, you know, looks like relativistic Hamiltonian. And yeah, we didn't, this is, I was very suspicious about this, even though questions work very well. Uh, so, but simulations really confirm that. Relativistic, the green is relativistic dark light is actually our open system at that point. But again, I don't know why I was surprised. I mean, graphene really does look like, you know, masterless fermion to an extent. So, yeah. so again, this is this is all what happens in condensed matter theory. It all goes under this umbrella of this rather uh, unpleasant master equation. Um, any question about this? Oh, so how much time do we have? Seven minutes. So, oh, good. Thank you. Any questions? So I wanted to show you a second application. Of course, um, we have many more applications, uh, but this is actually kind of nice because uh, uh, you kind of capture some coverage of how it works. So how to make lead move like gold using this, this idea. So wh why do we see things, first of all? We need to formalize this question. Why do we see uh, something? You see, because you know, incident light, after interacting with the system, does not look like 
uh, the, uh, the light that after interaction with the system does not look like the incident. And this difference actually is perceived as C. Now, so what is the relationship between our, uh, you know, output light and input incident light? And it's, you know, pretty much 99% of cases, it's a very beautiful linear relationship. And that's actually what, what's known as a linear spectroscopy. Showing some lines, there is some spectrum which uniquely identifies the system, and that you can see by measuring the light that passed through. However, once the intensity of the light goes up, intensity of light goes up, this is no longer linear. And the, the, the brighter the intensity, the more nonlinear the, the thing becomes. The relationship between output, the polarization, plausibility, that's a scientific term, and the incident field. So to make things, two different systems, look alike. It's equivalent to the question is that by given an output of my desire, can I find an input such that when, when it interacts with a specified system, it will match exactly that output that I want? Right. In other words, can we find a pulse, incident pulse, such that for a given system it, it produces exactly the output we want for, for all? So the answer was surprisingly yes, unquestionable yes, under one approximation, which is a dipole approximation, which is actually a good approximation. Uh, so, and how does it relate to what I told you before? It's, it's a very simple thing. You just need to look up Wikipedia what polarizability means. It actually means this. Uh, for, 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 uh, according to, it's called the Lamour formula in classical physics. And then, you know, this is why this is where dipole approximation enters because you know you assume that thing is just a bunch of phosphorescent dipoles, and that's actually that's what it is. The, the plausibility is just a second derivative. That's a more formula of the dipole moment for n is being number of electrons in your system. N is assumed to be any given. Now, so you actually can work it out what this expectation value means, and actually means this. It looks like this. You have a bunch of one body operators, local operators. Uh, and you have this N, which is number of electrons times the driving incident field. And this is actually, this looks kind of really funny because uh, you know the output is this. So this is our Y, this is what we want to get. Right? Right, this is all this thing. So it seems like, oh, if I just take E, <laughs> you know, move, move this expectation value to the left, you know, take the difference and we are done. Surprisingly, that's pretty much, it's actually correct. You know, it turns out to be correct. However, one has to be very careful. There is, a, uh, there is something interesting what happens that this expectation value hides the effect of the field. Its expectation value itself depends on the field, right? It's not just expectation value over some, some, you know, unrelated state. It's expectation value on the state of the system, which depends also on the value of the field. So this is kind of a little bit like a, uh, becomes self-consistent problem, but to be honest, this approximation works, uh, this is why it can be really easily approximated, and you end up with a, with a kind of an algorithm where you solve Schrodinger equation without knowing the field, and you simultaneously find the state and the field at the same time. Very simple, very cheap algorithm, I mean cheap, as, as hard as solving Schrodinger equation, there's no more complexity added to it. And you find the wave function and the, and, 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 and the field. Now, I didn't tell you the most amazing fact that this actual equation does not depend on what kind of system it is. Meaning, uh, this will look the same way. Of course, f will have to look different, but it will have the same mathematical structure where the system is open, closed, classical. It's all the same thing, it will look exactly that. The, the difference only becomes what the shape of function f is. Which means that you can actually make any system look alike. Not just two quantum systems look like each other, but the quantum system can actually be made look like classical, or even more interesting, classical system can be made like look like quantum. Um, and I will show you some simulations. So three different systems, three very different laser fields, and they produce three identical outputs. So that's uh, that actually one of the systems. This system is closed. This and these two are actually open with different uh, types of models of open systems. 
<coughs> so, yeah, we got quite a bit of coverage about this. Uh, and just to conclude, um, so we actually tried to develop, you know, uh, we wanna, when we do this ODM, we kind of get three, go to three dimensions. You know, we derive new models, we try to derive new models, but so we uncover, unfortunately, which gets it some inconsistencies with the previous model, and also we need to design the numerical methods actually to, to be able to actually see that actually these equations actually work the way they work and they're, they're, they're physical, they're physically meaningful. Thank you for your attention. Questions for Dennis? Yeah. Um, what, if, uh, what would be the next step take the uh, one of your systems to a, a more macroscopic uh, model to show that you can do this and are you just going to say on, on single atoms or single molecule systems could you do it on, on an ensemble of, of things? But the ensemble in, in which sense? I mean it's, it's right I mean it's one the, the impersonation. Uh, ah the impersonation? Yeah. yeah it works for the whole for I mean that's yeah so this is what I said, and it's arbitrary, right? So it works for an ensemble, if you will, it works for an ensemble of interacting things. Interaction is all here in this diffusion value. So yeah, so this is really universal statement. The only uh, approximation is here is dipole approximation. The, the, you know, the, how the light couples to, the, how the matter is coupled into the light, which, you know, means that it's just couples as a dipole times electric field. Everything else, Which has electrons? Yeah. By the way, no electrons. You have division by zero. Right. <laughs> so um, again, uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand something. So, uh, um, so imagine that you, as I think you said, uh, you can reproduce uh, um, uh, like condensed matter. Okay. So some particle moving in some crystal or something. Uh, so by matching the observations. So, but we so we make an experiment uh, making uh, some some this particle yeah, going so through crystal, and we know what we should observe. Then you match this observation, and you find that corresponding a. How much can you infer from this a about the you know structure of the crystal or, or whatever? Yeah. So that, so this is a very hard question because what we what we do we don't do that in a systematic way. We rather we rather take systematically these kind of relationships, right? Expectation values as a function, and there relationship between them to convert into A. But what A actually means microscopically, uh, like it, it has to be investigated case by case. So I mean, there's no, there's no like algorithm to run So is it correct my understanding that you, in some sense, you are probing very little of the crystal, like you just need little information, this uh, yeah, little yeah. things, and I see, okay. But again, the price to pay is that you get ambiguities. Yeah, yeah. That's in right. Masters, right? A is not defined uniquely. Right. A is defined in many ways. Okay. And so and that has something to do, that's precisely, it's a, Makes sense because you didn't specify the whole banana, you just specify a few things. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. What do you expect? You know, to what? And then I have another question. <laughs> so, you also mentioned finite dimensional systems, but then I, I, again, I'm not familiar much with the you know, qubits. But uh, then, do you, what is the course? Do you have a phase space in that case? or? Uh, if you want, you can have a phase space, but uh, this, uh, this, uh, like re this process of uncovering A uh, does not depend on the phase space. It can be done in phase space. Uh, it can be done in density matrix. It doesn't have to be. Phase space is great for visualizing and um, thinking physically what's going on, but it doesn't mean. Uh, but actually, I think you're asking a bit. Uh, let, let me just kind of abuse your question. And uh, so we were not the first one to ask this question: you know, Can you match two spectral responses of different systems? We were definitely not the first one to ask. Um, but what we actually so people were asking this question by making one assumption, always, and they didn't think it was an assumption. That's the problem, I think there were things. I said, oh, let me assume that my quantum system has 100 levels. You know, I have a 100 level plus system. Can 100 level plus system look like another 100 level plus system? And the problem was that, no, it starts, like, you cannot say something definitely. You have to be case by case, depends. Depends, there was no universal statement. Um, and why it was the case? Actually, it turns out that once you say that your quantum system has 100 levels or even billion levels, 
you actually make an assumption on the energy scale. And that assumption actually messes up your equations badly. So uh, once you assume no information, even once you said that my system is infinite dimen lives in an infinite dimensional space, right? Because Schrodinger equation is differential equation, lives in infinite dimensional space. You don't make any assumptions on the number of levels, you know, an approximate system. You actually not, you just have this n times e, where n is number of levels. So if you assume number of levels, this equation looks very different. There's a double commutator here. There's a whole function here which turns into zero. And of course, when it turns into zero, you know, till it goes to infinity. And that's the problem. So this is your, this dimensionality is amazing stuff. I have a dream to write a paper about dimensionalities. In quantum. So there are interesting things. It's a kind of fetish in mathematics, right? So you know, when you have a, so I know physical concept, the following sentences have physical consequences. Large finite dimensionality is different from inf like infinite dimensionality. Here's an example, but there are other examples involving dynamical decoupling. Dynamical decoupling can be done for finite dimensional systems, but cannot be done for infinite dimensional systems. Now, but there is even more one recent example I got where you have this difference between uncountable dimensionality and countable dimensionality. Again, physical experiments, like for example, uh, you can never have Galileo principle working in uncountable dimensionality. Price of life. Even if it's infinite dimensional, if it, it's, there are weird things. Anyway, so yeah, this is this kind of thinking about expectation arises because you have to solve this as a kind of mathematical problem. You treat this as a first step as a mathematical problem, and you have to, unfortunately, you know, you have to think about this stuff um, before you start thinking what is this can be done to experiments. But fortunately, it can. Be.